Hello everyone, it's Jabari here. Welcome to episode 6 of my African Weapon series. Yeah, I haven't been doing exactly the best job mentioning the series in my past few editions, but we're turning over a new leaf now. All African Weapons videos will be available on a public playlist on my channel, so anyway, today we'll be discussing a few weapons that are very seldom mentioned in regards to African weapons collectively. Those of Southern Africa. Obviously, there's one weapon in particular that is one of the most popular in all of African history, but there are a few others as well that you may be very surprised to hear about. So first, let's get the most obvious one out of the way. Anyone even slightly well versed in African history has probably heard of this one, or at the very least, you may have seen it but been unaware of its name. The Ikwa. The Ikwa was a close range weapon developed by the Zulu Empire, or more specifically, by King Shaka Zulu in the 19th century. The Ikwa is a short thrusting weapon designed to discourage cowardice by forcing warriors to charge into close range battle. While weapons like bows and arrows were known to the Zulu, they were very, very rarely used for the same reason, and this fact is true even for long spears or throwing spears, the latter which is known throughout Africa collectively as the Asegai, or Isijula in the Zulu language. In other words, the Zulu did not use long spears or projectile weapons, relying more on a military strategy that encouraged closing in on an enemy and pinching them into close range battle, a tactic usually accomplished by the infamous Cowhorn Formation a strategy endemic to southern African armies during a period of widespread warfare and chaos known as Mfekane. The Ndebele peoples also had a weapon similar to the Zulu Ikwa known as the Mpengula. The only difference is that the latter had thick iron bands around the tang and a chisel-like multipurpose tool in the hilt. By the way, before we forget, summertime is pretty much here and with summer comes hot weather. And unfortunately for our African ancestors, it was always summer and always hot. In some cases, it was the hottest places in the entire world. But fortunately for us, most of us at least, it's... Uh, uh, most of us at least, we, we don't live in the hottest places in the entire world, and we can enjoy the coldest water. The coldest water thermoses can keep your water icy cold for over 36 hours. This is accomplished through its advanced lid technology, which also includes this tiny little puncture hole which lets in just enough air to build up pressure necessary to drink water through its built-in straw thereby keeping your water much colder, much longer than other thermoses. It's so well insulated that it doesn't even sweat on the outside from condensing water so everything around it stays dry. Also, if you take it in the water with you, it has a rubber grip and a handle so you can hang onto it easier, and it floats so you won't have to worry about it sinking to the bottom of the water. It fits in most cup holders, bike racks, and cars, and it also comes in multiple sizes. This 32 ounce was more than enough, though admittedly I should probably drink more water so I might consider getting their 64 ounce or their gallon thermos. You can enter for a chance to win a free gallon thermos at the link down below, or receive a 10% discount on your entire order using my referral link, also down below. Despite the popularity of the Zulu Ikwa, the weapons of Southern Africa consisted of much more than just spears. The Zulu, as well as the Suthu, Ngundi, and other ethnic groups of the region used a battle axe as well, with a distinctly triangular shaped head. This was likely used to counter the shields endemic to the region, which largely consisted of tough cowhide of varying shapes and sizes depending on the respective ethnic group that created it. It may have also been useful against the Suthu warriors, who wore a unique type of armor, a large brass pendant worn around the neck to protect the chest. For the Zulu, Sangha, and Venda, however, this axe was mostly used as a status symbol rather than for purposes of combat. The latter two refer to this axe as the Mbado, and it had a distinct shape from other battle axes of the region. Its triangular blade protruded more at the top half than the bottom, making it conducive to both stabbing and slashing. The Shona people had a similar battle axe called the Gano, which was carried by ritual specialists known as Ngana. The axe symbolized the legitimacy of ownership of the land, and to this day it is still carried in modern ceremonies to denote the nation's independence. The Tlokowo's people's battle axe was seldom used in melee engagements at all, and instead was thrown from afar. It had a large, long, sickle-shaped blade for this purpose. Despite the majority of peoples in South Africa using spears and axes, the Shona may be exceptional in the fact that they also developed swords. Since they varied in length, many would be more properly described as knives or daggers though, 
but some reach sizes and shapes that would be considered swords. These blades, which the Shona call Bakatua, are short, straight, double-edged weapons with some measuring just over 2 feet in length, or 71 centimeters. The hilt was made of wood, which contained geometric carvings and tightly wound brass wire. Single-edged variants also existed, but these were typically the smaller ones. Outside of Bantu communities, we have the indigenous peoples of the region, which some refer to as Bushmen or San, both of which can be taken as derogatory terms, so we'll just collectively call them Southern Hunters. In comparison to their Bantu neighbors, their arsenal was rather limited as they were primarily hunter-gatherers and as such, their weapons were much more conducive to hunting wild game. Unlike the Bantu who were farmers and lived in sedentary kingdoms and chiefdoms, the southern hunters had no armies and no need to use much else aside their traditional bows which were small and weak as they were specifically designed for hunting wild game. Their arrows however were deceivingly effective. They would be composed of thin reeds that were gently strengthened by running them through a groove notched into a heated rock. Their heads could be straight or barbed and could be composed of bone, quartz, or iron, the latter of which was acquired by way of trade with Bantu peoples. However, despite the relatively small and weak nature of these bows and arrows, their heads would be dipped in a highly complex toxic solution, which could even be used to take down large game without making the meat unsafe for human consumption. Aside from this, the southern hunters traditionally were not warlike people and suffered massive displacement from invaders of both Bantu and European origin throughout the 19th century, or the same aforementioned Mfekane period. The weapons of Europeans and Bantu communities were, for lack of a better explanation, more conducive to killing humans rather than animals. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, like, share, and subscribe. For sources, check out my website, linked below. If you'd like to support future projects, you can do so there as well, or by clicking the join button below, or by becoming a patron. I hope you all enjoyed the video, thanks for watching as usual, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.